So if Hargreaves Lansdowne was to go into administration, become insolvent, go bust, or however you might want to put it, then that potentially would seem quite an apocalyptic day given they have approximately 120 billion and 1.5 million clients. But to play the devil's advocate, as I could see in the analytics that I'd done from a previous video, that there was a significant interest in understanding and learning about the implications of an investment platform, such as Hargreaves Lansdowne, being unable to meet its obligations and the impact that this would have on investors, whether holding cash, shares or funds, or a combination of all of these kinds of assets. So let's have a look at how this kind of event would impact on the various types of holdings to get a better sense of the risks and also the protections that are in place to attempt to mitigate those issues. I'll also be referencing what happened at Beaufort Securities, a brokerage that went bust in 2018 and left around 16,000 customers wondering what would become of their investments. This process is made much more complex due to a general investment account, ISA or pension being potentially made up of different assets that are also treated differently according to the protections in place for each. And we have to be mindful of what element it is we're actually referring to in terms of what's going insolvent, whether that's the underlying investment, e.g. the bank account in the case of cash, the fund or Hargreaves Lansdowne themselves. For example, a bank that the platform uses to hold client cash could fail. We also need to be mindful that although we are talking about the possibility of failure, it is important to keep it in perspective and consider the likelihood of an actual failure occurring. Also, I think from now on, I'll just refer to them as AHL just to make life easier and I'll also be saying it a lot. First up is cash. We are all likely to hold some cash in our account. So whether we have a SIP or ITA, we're likely to have some money in the cash account. That could be cash from investments, a buffer to cover charges from dividends, etc. So first thing to mention is that the company's policy on cash held in the account is only to use institutions with a UK banking license, which is covered by the Financial Services Compensation, FSCS for short. And the FSCS is backed by government and protects clients with deposits up to £85,000 in the event that a bank, building society or credit union defaults. Client money held within the HL service and the portfolio management service is deposited across a treasury committed approved panel of institutions with UK banking licenses, excluding the HL cash ISA, which is held solely with Lloyds Bank PLC. The full panel of approved institutions they use and actively hold client money with is the Bank of Scotland PLC, Barclays Bank, Goldman Sachs International Bank, HSBC Bank, Investec Bank, Lloyds Bank, Santander UK, Lloyds Bank Corporate Markets, and the UK regulated branches of Qatar National Bank, Emirates NBD, and Bank of Montreal. The balances are not distributed evenly across the banks as each bank has their own scale and appetite, but they do manage balances on a pooled basis with considerations to what that means for clients on an individual basis. They did say in correspondence with myself that they are aware of the minimum balance held in cash with HL before a client would potentially be above the FSCS protection limit. But this changes intraday as the balances with each bank change. Now they cannot ensure that everybody is fully covered by the scheme, but they can ensure that they proactively monitor the banks they use and have concentration limits for each bank which governs that balances are appropriately diversified to minimize any risk of loss. As a guide, the maximum allocation to a core bank is 35% of cash balances. This would be the highest permissible concentration, albeit they are rarely at this level. If they held 35% with one bank, someone would need a balance of over 244,000 before 35% of their balance would be over the 85,000 pound protection limit. Whilst the actual allocation is lower, it does change constantly as balances move. At time of doing this video, the highest concentration was 25%. So the balance required to be over the 85,000 would need to be 340,000 pounds. But obviously, the individual protection will depend on the aggregate balances held by that institution. As such, if someone had assets with a bank they used directly, this would also count towards our allocation of protection. The protection is per institution, or strictly speaking, per banking license. So slightly trickier when you have separate brands such as Halifax and Bank of Scotland that operate under the same license. The Bank of England and Bank Regulator, the Potential Regulation Authority, PRA, have worked with each bank to set up individual resolution plans in the event a bank faced distress. As part of this, the regulators defined options of how they can act. One method is to allow the bank to fail relying on the Financial Services Compensation Scheme to compensate impacted parties up to 85,000 per individual. An alternative to the FSES cover is the bank recovery 
and resolution directive bail-in process, which would seek to recapitalize a bank in distress by applying a proportional haircut to all eligible deposits. Eligible deposits being those over 85,000. This is the likely path of handling a default or large systemic bank, eradicating the concept of a taxpayer bailout. In this scenario, all client money held in trust accounts such as HL are excluded from the haircut process. This is why HL permits high proportions to be held at core banks such as Barclays, Bank of Scotland and Lloyds. All client money is held on trust and is segregated from their own funds in accordance with the FCA's client money rules and guidance so that any creditors of Hargreaves Lansdowne have no legal right to it and they cannot use any of this money to cover Hargreaves Lansdowne's obligations. In terms of shares, we know that in the UK around 63% of all shareholdings are held indirectly via a nominee account with a broker or platform. In the case of HL, stocks are held in the name or of or to the order of Hargreaves Lansdowne Nominees Limited or by an approved third party custodian. Hargreaves Lansdowne Nominees Limited is a non-trading company, so it cannot run up liabilities of its own, and HL accepts full liability for any default by the nominee company. This ultimately means all client assets are pooled together. There is an option to have your assets held separately in a segregated account, but it would cost you an eye-watering additional £7,500 per year per account on top of all the other normal charges. The crucial element here is that the records of all your investments and assets held via the nominee must be 100% correct and up to date and you will always remain the beneficial owner. The assets will at all times be ring fenced from the broker's business and therefore HR cannot use your holdings to meet obligations. However, in some cases a third party custodian could be used to hold certain overseas investments and therefore those investments will be subject to different legal or regulatory requirements, meaning that they may not benefit from the same protections that we have in the UK. There is a risk that the third party could exercise rights over your investments and reduce the amount of the investment. This is in effect the nature of having an investment that falls outside of the UK regulatory regime and is a potential risk. A measure that they have in place is that senior management and their CAS committee are responsible for periodic reviews of the nominees with which stock is deposited. Coming on to Beaufort Securities, the issue that occurred here was that when the company was pushed into administration and PwC was appointed, the insolvency costs were initially put at 100 million. This was later almost halved to the piddly sum of just 55 million. The primary issue here was that there was insufficient money in the business to meet these legal costs. And the legal basis that administrators are entitled to use is that they can use client assets to pay administration costs, is when there isn't sufficient money within the firm to pay the costs of returning assets to clients. In effect, the clients themselves are having to pay for the cost of the administrator to get them their money back, and these costs can be deducted from client portfolios. In the case of Beaufort Securities, the FSCS stepped in not to compensate losses, but to cover PwC's costs as administrators. PwC started paying back the client money in September 18, and by April 19, the majority of Beaufort's retail customers had received their money back. Now, you technically could get around this by not having your assets on a platform at all, and you could own the shares directly. You could buy shares directly via the relevant company share registrar, whether it's a Quinty Capital or a computer share. Now, this process is far less simple, and trading is no longer just a case of clicking a few buttons, and tracking your investments will be a bit more of a manual job, but, but it's possible. Then you have the funds themselves. The funds you may well be investing in, this could be a Linzel Train, a Fundsmith, or a Bailey Gifford Fund, which are technically known as unit trusts or OICs. These use a trustee or depository to hold the title to the underlying stocks they hold in their funds. In a similar way that the platform holds stocks, this means that if the fund manager was to get into financial difficulty, the assets are protected from their creditors, the compensation limits would only potentially apply where assets weren't recoverable or cost of insolvency was an issue. UK-based fund managers are authorised by the FCA. If a fund management firm failed, then the 85,000 limit would apply per investor per failed firm. If all the money is held with one fund manager, for example, let's say Artemis, then only one 85,000 compensation limit would apply. If it was spread across two firms, then two limits would apply. Although there are protections in place, they are limited, really having seen the process firsthand of dealing with collapsed companies and administration, the process is long and slow. Having your money tied up and not being able to access it is a very uncomfortable place to be, and this all comes down to doing your due diligence on the platforms you use, 
understanding the risks and the realistic potential of a bad outcome of the company you're doing business with, whether it's a bank, a platform, a fund, or even a share you buy. Thank you so much for watching.